Good morning, everybody. We are live. Congratulations. It's Friday. Man, you made it through the week. Good job. Have a celebratory drink this weekend and look back at all the work you were able to do this week and be happy about what you did. My name is Brian Armentrout and I'm with the Food Leadership Group. We are a food safety consulting company based in Loveland, Colorado. We focus mainly on FDA plants and helping people put in food safety plans and food safety systems and quality management systems and all that fun stuff. And if you are here today live, thank you for joining us. We greatly appreciate it. And what you've stumbled upon, if you are new to this, is the food safety chat. And what we do every Friday is I bring on an amazing guest to talk about a food safety subject. And this is really different from what you normally see, right? This is, this is a conversation. This is kind of a back and forth. And really, we're here for you. We want to answer your questions as we dive into our topic today and get to know each other a little bit better. And what you'll notice is when you attend these over a period of time that uh, a lot of people attend these and we'll be building this really cool community. And with that, with locals, I'll, I'll talk more about that here later in the show as well. We're also building a area where we can communicate around recalls and other information and all kinds of cool stuff like that. And speaking of regulars, Tim is here and awesome to have Tim. He's a great contributor. Uh, and Stephanie, of course, from Germany. We always appreciate having her. I believe, Stephanie, you have something coming up as well, too. So everybody, if you're not connected with Tim and Stephanie, this is another great tool as well. It's go on LinkedIn and connect with these guys because we live stream this on LinkedIn, YouTube and Twitter every Friday at this time. So if you can't attend live, that's that's OK. You can still watch this afterwards as well. So that's a really awesome thing, too. So with that long-winded introduction, I'd like to introduce Cara. And Cara Mickelson is with the wonderful company Hydrite. And Cara is one of the great food safety experts that are out there. And if you follow her at all on LinkedIn, she has been one really busy person lately. How are you doing today, Cara? Good, good. How are you, Brian? Oh, yeah. I mean, doing great. I mean, it's, it's an interesting time of year here in Colorado. Um, the weather kind of comes and goes. We, we have a little bit of snow on the ground from earlier this week, but as often the case in Colorado, unlike Buffalo, where I lived for a while, um, the, it'll snow and then it melts and then it snows and it melts. And right now we're going through the melting part of it. And it, it's already, yeah, it's around 45 degrees. We're going to be in low 50s here today, but it's very windy. So how's the weather where you're at? It chilly. <laughs> it's been chilly and windy, but we don't have any. We just have a dusting of snow. We had a little bit of snow, but we're waiting for our, our snow to come. Usually we have some some you know pretty good snow drifts by now. So um so it's been a, a pretty mild, mild fall for the time being, but we'll wait. I'm in Wisconsin, so um it's coming. <laughs> oh, it's coming, yes. And so this is what's always cool about the chat as well, right? We get people from all over the world who join us, and it's great to see that. So Allie. Good to see you, my friend Austin. And Jean, I believe, I, I'm sure I mispronounced that, but I've heard of Pure Bioscience, so welcome. Welcome this morning uh, in Michigan. So yes, another cold location for sure. <laughs> so with that, one of the things, Cara, that I always want to do when, when we talk about a topic, and today we're going to be talking about environmental monitoring and stubborn micro squatters in your plant. But <laughs> before we dive in, Everybody, please join us for a ceremonial drink. And today I have water instead of my normal coffee, but it, it works just fine. And you got to show that mug. Show your mug. That is, <laughs> yeah, that is a... my cool uh, Sasquatch mug from the state of Washington. <laughs> I love it. So everybody, cheers. Cheers. Ah, there we go. Wonderful. So... Oh. Very interesting. I, I, I love the title we put on for our talk when we were prepping earlier on this. Um, how to evict those micro squatters in your plant, right? So you have, and microorganisms, right? It's unlike, you know, you have some chemical residue you need to wipe off of some equipment or things like this, right? Micro is a active opponent, right? It's going to figure out ways of how to circumvent your systems, how to set up a home. And when it does, right, it wants to go to other places too and set up other homes. And one of those things, right, is, I mean, really, Carl, in a plant, I mean, where do these things live, right? What's 
Exactly. Yeah. And, and so, and, and the reason that we kind of bumped into this subject was I gave a presentation earlier this week at a conference and I entitled it microbial real estate, you know, finding the homes of microorganisms. And I related it to, you know, what do you look for in a home? Well, we look for shelter, we look for food and we look for protection and things like that. And that's, that's what micro is looking for too. Right. So they're trying to find that, that good home that they can take up residency. Uh, that, that's a great analogy. I love that, right? Because they're they're just like us, right? They need the right temperature. They need shelter. They need some water. They need some food. And yeah. if things are look along that way, they're like, oh, uh, I, I think I'm just gonna, <laughs> I think I'm just gonna stay here for a while, right? Exactly, exactly. And a setup shop, right? You, know, you get those yeah, house exactly. pests. <laughs> And it, keeping the house analogy going is it, it's it's not like they're knocking on the front door and asking to come in, right? So, how did they get in? How do they sneak past you? Right, right. And you know, it's always like you know, how do they get in? And I always think of um, you know, people, ingredients, and environment. Right, those are the three sources of contamination or potential contamination. So you kind of narrow it down to that and 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 start your investigation. So. Mm -hmm. Well, and even on that side, right, we hear about niches, right? So what, what's a niche? Yeah, and yeah, so a microbial niche is where you, you get that buildup where it's protected from that normal sanitation. It's not going to be something that receives that routine sanitation or, or you know, they're hiding from that routine sanitation uh, event that you might conduct. So it might be a case where, you, you know, you got to take something apart or you have to have to take down, uh, a, you know, a piece of equipment further than what you're you're used to um, and get into that area that doesn't receive that normal sanitary um, event on a routine basis. Ah, oh, that's a really good point because part of this too, right, is sanitation crews, tough job, right? No, number oh, one, right? They are super important in plants, right? If if the san if you don't have a good sanitation crew, you're 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 dead in the water to begin with. And now the other side of that is finding the right people and keeping the right people to do those roles is really hard because a lot of times sanitation takes place on third shift in the middle of the night and yeah. nobody sees them, right? And people just come in in the morning for the first shift and, hey, look at that, it's amazing. The plant is clean again, let's manufacture more. Mm -hmm. And they don't see all the struggles and all the work that took place during the night. Right. And, and they're usually pressed for time. They're, you oh. know, that's usually, you know, they, there's, a, there's a window, right? And, and that window has to be met because, you know, production is, is important too, so. Um, that's a good point. Right. And, and, and we see this all the time too, car right? Is, oh, okay, well, we have an eight hour window for sanitation. How can we cut that down? Yep. Right? <laughs> yep. And, <laughs> and here's, here's the paradoxical problem here as well is that during the busy time, so I, I used to work in dairy and, you know, beverage manufacturing and things like this, right? This tends to be the busy time of year, right? People are buying cheese for parties and special beverages and all these type of things. And production really ramps up. So now it's kind of a double whammy. It's the holidays and people are taking time off and you're trying to get out as much production as you can and sanitation needs to be compressed and equipment breaks down and, and you overrun on your shift. And it's like, okay, sorry, sanitation guys. We only have four hours to clean now instead of eight and oh. you're rush, rush, rush. And that, that is when your problems happen. And yeah. I remember one time we had an issue in a, in a company I was working for and I was talking with my CEO and he's like, oh gosh, you know, Brian, why? Why did this problem happen now? This is the worst time for this problem to happen, right? For all these other reasons. Right. And I turned to him and I'm like, that's why it happened, right? Is of course it happens at this time, right? We're we're pushing, we're pushing too hard and we went too far. Yeah. And he kind of went, oh, right. Yeah. And kind of a light bulb clicked, right? So that's kind of the paradoxical part of all of this, right? Is that time is when you need to really focus. And to your point, Cara, which was a good one, right? If you're pressed for time and you got that positive displacement pump sitting there in the plant and it takes you four hours just to take the darn thing apart, you're going to be like, eh, shoot, I, eh, nope. I, it's I'll not going it to <laughs> yeah, I'll get it tomorrow. Nobody's going to know. Right. Yeah. Well, then all of a sudden you've got cold form in your finished product and you're like, oh, where did that come from? I wonder. Yeah. And, <laughs> and if you make something difficult to pull apart, it's just, it's not going to happen. Right. No. And I understand I, it's human nature, <laughs> you know? So. Right. And, and we see this and I've had chats on this before too, is that equipment is not necessarily designed for ease of cleaning. It's 
designed for operational efficiency, right? Yeah. So when the engineering guys are going out and they're saying, "Yo, we need we need a new packaging machine," okay, well, what's the fastest packaging machine that's out there? Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, and I, I and I'm gonna guess one that's not very cleanable. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or worse, right? Is you walk into a plant, and we were talking about this when we were preparing for this chat. Is um, you walk into a plant and you're like, oh, hey, guys, that's a new piece of equipment. When did that go in? And the, the maintenance and the engineering guys says, oh, yeah, yeah, we're really excited about that. We found this really cheap piece of machinery, you know, that was sitting out in a field and it was available for auction. And you're just like, oh, right. what? Right. And it's like, <laughs> did you tear this thing apart? What what was it used for before this? Oh, it's like, yeah. oh, it's using a peanut plant. Ah, what? <laughs> Right? <laughs> You're kidding me, right? And yeah. all these little hidden landmines and other things too. Like one of the things that happens in plants all the time is sensitive things are covered up, right? So just like that packaging machine I was talking about, yeah. right? We have PLCs and control panels and these other things. And the and the uh, manufacturers say, hey, listen, you know, you can't, you know, go up to this panel and spray it down with a hose. You're going to damage this equipment. You need to cover it up during yeah. sanitation. So that means it's not getting cleaned. Exactly. Yep. Control panels are always or potentially a you know a culprit, right? And and people just forget because you yeah. you obviously you don't want to ruin your equipment, but you you know you have to be able to to get to it at some frequency uh, to ensure that it's not going to become a source of contamination. Uh -huh. Right, and we'll talk more about you know zones and things like this here later in the chat. But that, you know, buttons on a PLC or things like this are a, oh, FDA loves, 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 loves those, right? Because if you're the operator of that machine all day long, you're doing this, right? Punching the buttons, going and touching the product and you're punching the buttons and you're touching the product. And that is a prime place for the transfer of our little friends who are living in their homes. Exactly. And talk about a growth niche, you know, that's a that's a prime location there. So that, that doesn't get that normal sanitation event. So. No, exactly. And part of this too, right, with these niches is within a plant is different bacteria prefer different areas, right? So yep. some bacteria, you know, they're, they're retired and they don't want to be down in Florida, right? So they like it nice and warm and humid and that's what they like. There's other ones that prefer a colder climate, right? So listeria is going to be hanging out at the edge of your freezer area or a tunnel where you're doing some cooling or things like this. And they like that environment better. Yeah. yeah. So it's not all equal, right? It's not the same. I and, I, and that's in the presentation I gave, I kind of, you know, I equated it just to that, like what you say, you know, I, I'm ready to, to be in warm, I live in Wisconsin, I'm ready to go, you know, warm. <laughs> I'm yeah, getting exactly. to that age. I'm wearing my nice turtleneck and, and I'm ready to, the, to get to that, that warm location. Um, yeah, you know, it's like, you know, I, I've about had enough of this, exactly. Yeah, right? yeah. But, but that's the exact same thing. And that's, you know, when you are doing an investigation or you're trying to find these, these squatters, it, it is helpful to know who you're looking for, right? You, you know, who are you looking for? Who are the tenants? Who are the squatters? Because they do, like you say, have different expectations for their home, uh, yeah. just like we do. So it's the exact same thing. Exactly. Well, and part of this too, right, is that transfer. So in your environmental monitoring program, you're focusing on your, your GMP areas and things like this. But part of this too, right, is what about the office areas and what about the locker rooms and stuff like that where people start off their day and then they come in yeah. to those areas because these bacteria have become very efficient over time at becoming hitchhikers, right? So they can yeah. come in on our shoes, they can come in on the wind, they can come in on the air. Maybe that fan that's blowing cool air down into the plant to keep everybody comfortable. You know, all kinds of different sources, right? Yeah, and and I so many times, you know, if you don't have some kind of captive footwear or some kind of mitigation strategy for your shoes, it can be a great vehicle. People can be an awesome vehicle to bring those guys in, uh, and and you know, take up harborage in your in your manufacturing facility. So. Right, and, and and that's why, right? Is that, and I think this is an important point to emphasize here is that this is why quality systems are quality systems, right? Everything works together. So if you can be monitoring the environment and have a fantastic sanitation program, but if your GMPs are kind of eh, right, that's going to impact it. Absolutely. Um, because part of the GMP part, it's, 
you just can't give your once a year presentation and think everybody's going to understand it because they don't because we've all had this experience is hey there car i see you're working on this line oh yeah 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 okay well did you wash your hands oh no no, no. i'm good i have gloves on yep oh <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. They, you know, a right. lot of people think that putting on gloves is this magic shield that keeps yes. any form of contamination from happening, and yeah. that's yeah. not the case, right? If it's anything it makes it worse, case. yeah. Right? Sometimes it can because people don't realize that their hands are dirty because they have yeah. gloves on. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, no, I. That is a very valid point, and and not that gloves are bad. You just have to be mindful. Right. Yeah. And, and understand what they're they're trying to achieve. So. Yeah, we, we, we did a study in a, a past company I was at where we had a, pro, a process where there was a manual step at the end for packaging and people had to put you know product in the in the packaging line to do the final product film around it. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of people at these stations that would be touching product. Right. And it's like, OK, everybody's got to wear gloves. Everybody's got sleeves on everybody, you know, all this type of things. And we did a study and we determined that the gloves were actually detrimental yep. and that when people didn't have gloves on and followed proper sanitation and hand dipping and all these types of things, we got better results. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so funny that you say that because we did a similar study when I was in a previous life and uh, it was with a, a cheese manufacturer and, and they, it was the same thing, but they were wearing gloves, but it was actually a physical hazard for them because it was, they were getting caught in the machinery. And so oh. they, you know, you can't have that obviously. And, um, but we were able to demonstrate that, you know, with hand dips and hand washing and all of that, it was completely an effective system. So, and, and reduce the contamination levels. Yeah. And it, it, two good points come out of that for me around that is, um, so the first one, and, and you know, Austin is really good about talking about this as well too, is there's the technical side of things that we talk about and the behavioral side of things that we talk about. And this is a, this is a good area where we have overlap with, with human safety in plants, exactly. right? So what we do for OSHA and things like this, because part of this is human nature. If, if I'm on a filling machine and I'm, I've been doing this for the last five years, and there's some open areas where product gets stuck or things like that. And, and I, after a while, I just start reaching in there, right? Because that risk has been diminished over time because I no longer see that as a risk. Right? Right. And that's where those type of things happen, right? Where gloves get grabbed and things like this. Mm -hmm. And people need to be constantly reinforced around these things. The other side of this too, Cara, is, is that um, we become accustomed to our environment. And you see this all the time too, right? We come in and we visit plants and we go out to help people solve problems and we get the, you know, initial walk through and we're looking at different stuff and we're, you know, we're, we're doing this and we're looking around and we're like, what's that? And, and they're like, what, what, that, what? And it's like, oh no, that, that looks like that's pretty dirty and contaminant. And they're like, oh, oh, you're, you know, you're right. I, I, and you know, they're embarrassed. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're like, wow, that's amazing. How did you see that? And it's like, well, well, no, it's just that I have what I call fresh eyes. Right. I, yeah. I'm going into this environment, looking at things completely different than they do, because people are creatures of habit. Right. And you go in and habit is not a bad thing. Right. It's it makes things more efficient. Right. It's like getting ready in the morning. If you had to hunt for your toothbrush every morning, it's like, well, where did I leave my toothbrush? Right. Is it in the fridge? Is it in the garage? Right. Every you go on this massive search to find your toothbrush. No, that's a waste of time. Your toothbrush is always in the same spot next to your sink, right? And you're just like, you know, you wake up in the morning, going, oh, all right, and you're grabbing for your toothbrush. Habit, right? Well, yeah. what's good about yeah. that is also bad about that because we block things out. And the other good piece around this too, right, which is worth reinforcing too, is we think that when we're watching things and looking at things that we see everything, right, Cara? That yeah. everything in our field of view has our equal attention. Absolutely not. Absolutely yeah. not. Yeah. And this is why magicians can do what they do, right? Because when you're watching a magic trick, right? They're like, oh, watch, watch, watch here. But really what's going on is over here, right? And then all of a sudden, whoop, there's the coin. Everybody's like, oh my gosh, look at that. Yeah. No, they're controlling your focus. Right. Yeah. And I, and I love your, you know, the fresh set of eyes because that a lot of times that's just why I'm brought in and, yeah. and you too, you know, because we've, and we've seen things, right? We've, we've been around the block a few 
a couple times and and just see different things and see it in a different light, see it in a different way than than somebody who's been seeing it routinely. And yeah. and it really does help. And and it really, you know, and, and and I know we talked about this in our prep too. You know, sometimes we'll be like, well, that's so obvious to us, you yeah. know, because we've seen it hundreds of times and time and time again. But somebody who maybe hasn't seen it ever is mm -hmm. going to, it's going to be eye opening. So, yeah. well, I think too, right? There's, there's a good regulatory lesson there as well is FDA is getting our eyes as well, right? Right. So yeah. when FISMA first started, you know, HACCP plans and things like this, unless we showed them to FDA, they didn't have a statutory right in most cases. Now, LACF and seafood and juice HACCP and things like this, they could. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of different products, I won't stick on dairy because that's what you and I know best. Right. And, you know, we could show them our HACCP plan if we chose to, but we didn't have to. Now, right. under FISMA, right, every, your food safety plans are completely visible to FDA. And as FISMA has been growing and FDA has been getting more and more understanding, they're developing the same eyes that we have, right? right. So if, if FDA is going in to do an inspection in a dairy plant, they already have a pretty good idea what to look for, right? So they understand the microbiological, chemical, and physical risks, right? It's why FDA created Appendix 1, right? To kind of mm -hmm. some guards mm -hmm. around that. And they know, right? So they're like, okay, now that I have changed and as an investigator for FDA, I'm a specialist, right? I'm, I'm mainly auditing food plants. And a lot of times I'm going to dairy plants. They're getting better and better at going in and doing their investigations. And they have really good eyes too. So to your point, Car, and I think this is a good point to emphasize, is if you and I are going in and seeing these things, FDA is going to see them too. So right. You, right. yeah, you better find them before FDA does. Exactly. Yep, I agree. And and it is important to bring in that that extra set of eyes and and somebody who's not intimately involved in the in the process on a day to day basis because mm -hmm. they you know you do see different things and exactly you do, you do have that fresh fresh look. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and part of it too, right, is that a lot of times too we'll look at stories in the food safety news. And we'll be like, oh my goodness, how did this happen, right? So for me, kind of the poster child has been, it's been the, you know, the poor GIF plant in Kentucky. And they had a resident strain of salmonella that had been there for like, what, a decade, a decade it had been in this plant. And as outsiders, where we're like, we're like oh my goodness, how does that even happen, right? Mm -hmm. What was missing, right? And it's really what we're talking about right now, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and yeah, yeah. Just how does, how, and how do you battle it? Right. How, yeah. You know, how do you, how do you mitigate that? So. Well, and part of it too, right. Is, is knowing who your squatters are because a yep. lot of times too, some are harder to get rid of. Once salmonella sets up in like your floor drains or things like this, good luck, right? Salmonella. Okay. Ooh, it's tough, right? It, it doesn't want to go anywhere. Yep. Yep. Coronabacter is another one that, oh. you know, just, so difficult to to eradicate to evict. <laughs> and yeah. I, I've been saying that now. Now that I've got this whole like real estate thing going on, I'm like, no, like we're going to use that terminology. <laughs> yeah, Allie made the comment here. She she loves the squatters term too, I, and that is a really good analogy, right? Because you're going out there and you're saying, "Hey, buddy, you don't belong here," and they're like, mm, "Nah, I'm going to stay." Right. right? Like yeah. You, you have yeah. To kick them out. yeah. Yeah. In my presentation, I, you know, I put sold signs, you know, <laughs> when you, when you find it like in hollow rollers, it's sold. <laughs> yeah. It, it's it's sold. Sold. They're like, Ooh, right. Yeah. So for, the, <laughs> so for a squatter, things like hollow rollers and underneath, you know, fittings on floors and things like that. Right. That's yeah. Prime real estate, right. They're paying top dollar for that. They are. Um, yeah. Especially in this market. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And I, I and part of it too, right? I mean, Kara is is as outsiders, right? We'll look at these issues, like you know, the one we were just talking about, and it's just like, oh my goodness, how does that happen, right? And part of this, right, is what we're talking about, is those fresh set of eyes and looking at things from a new perspective. And a lot of times too, once these things get set up, um, something we haven't really talked about here is one of the def great defenses these squatters have, right? Is is they'll set up home and then they build a tent. And then they build a house 
and then it's a brick house, right? And, and that's right. biofilm, right? Yeah, exactly. And you hit the nail on the head because that's exactly in the presentation I gave. You know, it was like, okay, so who is the tenant? And then what are they looking for? And then how do they maintain? And it's just like our houses, right? And I always yeah. use the analogy, my folks live in a hundred year old house and it takes a lot of maintenance to, to keep that house running, but it's running. And, you know, biofilms are, are the same same type of thing. And once you get that biofilm, film built up it's it's a tough thing to to eradicate without you know manual scrubbing or you know certain types of programs to eradicate those biofilms so. right well and, and paradoxically as well right those biofilms set up in areas that you don't do a good job cleaning right so right. it's got a, an amazing opportunity to grow and then keeping the the house analogy going here at some point the kids get big Right? And they go out and set up their own houses, right? So pieces break off of the biofilm and then they go set up house somewhere else. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun. I'm loving this too. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Hopefully they don't they don't live in your basement, right? You know. <laughs> exactly. You can stay around, stick around and live in your basement. They <laughs> they branch off and they go into on the bigger and better. So yeah, exactly. And yeah, Tim had a good comment here too. So and so thank you, Tim, for being here as well. Tim, Tim is here almost every week, and we appreciate him a lot. So uh, pest versus pet. Pets you evict from your house. Pets you feed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. These are great. These, I, I love it. This is fun. This. Right. <laughs> well, and this is a good example, too, of what Austin talks about, too, with storytelling, right? We're, we're building this fun story up around this, right? Which means that people on the production floor are going to get it better, too, right? Yeah. It's like, oh, I yeah. need to admit that, these people, yeah, these things that don't belong here. Yeah, that's always my hope, you know, it, always my hope is that we can build these, you know, kind of stories, because I think if you can relate it, and that's why I put together the home analogy, it's like, if you can relate it, sometimes people are like, oh, that, you know, that makes sense. I do want shelter. I do want, you know, food, same kind of thing, you know, it just, the analogies kind of help recognize yeah. what that what that is like so. yeah I've, I've got the annoying relative that's coming to visit that i want to get out of there as, as quickly as i can yeah. <laughs> as fast as possible <laughs> time to scrub <laughs> <laughs> so i mean yeah so these, these biofilms and these things set up and then, then then you're behind the eight ball but i mean really it kind of comes back to your program and I, i'll be curious car to kind of get your your input on this too as well you know relative to environmental programs because my experience has been Right. You're, you're a quality manager and you start working in a company and you go there and you start looking at the programs and odds are, right, that there's already an environmental monitoring program in place. It was probably created God knows how long ago, right? 15 years ago, there was somebody who was working in the plant and she created this environmental monitoring program and set up the quarterly sampling. And here's the sites we sample. And here's how we do investigations and vector analysis if we have a hit. And it's never changed, right? They've been sampling the same spots forever. Yep, yep. And that's not gonna, it's seek and destroy, right? We, you know, we all have to live and by that, you know, mentality, we should really embrace that where you've got to be changing and you have to really think about too. And, and you know, we talked about it in our, in our pre- um, talk too. just, you have to change, you know, revisit your program. You have to have to think about your locations changed, just like you were talking about with bringing in new equipment, that might be a new awesome home for our micro. So, yeah. you know, you have to really think about that and change your sites and, and, and really have that mentality that you're going to, you're going to seek and destroy and try and find those homes that those micro are, are looking for. So. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, I mean, People change, right? We have new employees coming in and all the time. Plants change from an equipment standpoint and the plants themselves change, right? Because plants don't, you know, automatically spring out of the ground and that's exactly how the plant is, right? Plants grow too, yeah. right? So you, and, you have a- And plants you know, age, plants yeah. age. And, right. and you have, you know, and that, and I was talking about this with some people yesterday. It's, you know, you're, you're not everybody's going to have the luxury to be able to replace their floors every, you know, couple years when they, when they wear out, how are you going to manage that? How are you going right. to, and that's where your environmental monitoring comes into play too. You, if you know that that's an area that's going to be a problem, include that in your, in your program and really hit that 
hit that hard, you know, and really right. understand it. So. Well, and especially too, like in, in Wisconsin and your, your neck of the woods, right? You have, you have a lot of smaller manufacturers of, of really amazing cheese products and you'll go and visit them, right? And there's the original building that they were working in, right? And, and making their cheese and then they were successful. So they added another building yeah. on the side and then that was doing great. So then they put a new warehouse on the back, right? You end up with all these little rooms and things change over time. Yeah. Yeah. The very fact of, of how people walk exactly. and, and you're, and, and to your point too, right? Flooring. Oh my goodness, flooring, right? We all we all want dairy tile, right? That's that's a good thing, in most cases, right? But if you're in a, an environment with lots of fat on the floor, right, and things like that, those get very slick. Right. And a lot of times, right, you're like, okay, well, I don't have, to your point, Cara, a a, a very good floor in my plant. I'm going to epoxy coat the whole thing. And you start talking with salespeople and things like this. And their product is the best product in the world, and it's going to last forever. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. and you're out in the plant you're walking around and you're looking down and you notice that when you step down oh squish squish, squish yep. right? oh, and, yeah oh yeah it's like walking on a waterbed <laughs> yeah and boy that's a great home right there uh, yeah. oh man exactly and i think and in my experience and perhaps you you have similar experience people overlook that yeah. You, you, they, you know, you, you're walking on the waterbed and they're like, Ooh, you know, we're like, Oh my gosh. And, but people walk on it every day and don't even think twice about it. Exactly. Right. So part of this, right. And, and our advice, you know, with this, right. If it is, if you're in manufacturing facility, go reevaluate where you sample, right. And how often you sample, because part of this too, right. Is, is we've all, we're all familiar with the swabathons, right. And FDA is going in. Here's a little tidbit that a lot of people may not know, right? There's generally been two types of audits with FDA, right? There's a GMP audit, as they call it, right? Where they're just, just going in and doing a routine check. There's nothing, you know, we, we want to see if you're doing things correctly, right? You're just part of the rotation to come visit. Then there's the four cause audit, right? So FDA has a particular reason of why they're visiting. So there have been consumer complaints of illness or you have a high risk product that they want to look at or things like this. The third category is data gathering. FDA can simply come to your plant because they want to learn more about what you're making. And during those type of events, right, that's generally when those swabathons happen, right? Because they want to come in and say, hey, you know, we need to find out more about what the normal flora is in this type of a plant. So we're gonna come in and do a swabathon. Well, why, what did we do? Oh, nothing, you know, we're just, we're just doing this to gather data. And are they gonna be taking four samples? No, 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 right? They are, they are not going to be doing what you're doing. They're going to be coming in with a dedicated team that does this all the time, and they're going to sample hundreds of sites, right? Right, right. So if your environmental monitoring program is you're taking five swabs and you're, you're looking at the floors and the drains once a quarter, oh, boy, you're, you're in for a rude awakening. Yeah, yeah. And this is, and honestly, this is how, how I, I ended up connecting with you was you wrote that great article yeah. in Food Safety News about the, the update with the, the FDA um, sampling and environmental monitoring. And I really appreciate that. And hopefully everybody, you know, uh, has read that article and, and been able to, you know, take a look at that because that was really informative. And I appreciate well, that. So. Well, and again, it gets back to what we were talking about too. And I'm, I'm sure that pretty much everybody on on our chat here today has seen this from me as well is food safety is not the point of competition right yeah, we're nice. all here to get better because one plant in, influences and impacts in the mind of the consumer everyone else and now layer over this enhanced traceability Ooh, right so we've got the final rule now and we're seeing lots of webinars around there i need to learn more about that now too right because yeah. from talking with jose right there's some differences in there between what the guidance was saying and what the final version actually says. So little tip for everybody out there, go learn about enhanced traceability. Yeah. Um, and actually yesterday I was at the Wisconsin affiliate for IAFP meeting and uh, um, Alex O'Brien from the CDR gave a presentation on that, that rule. There's a lot. There's a, there, yeah. I, it's, it's, it, for me, it's overwhelming, um, and I just can't imagine being a manufacturer and trying to wrap my head around it. So it was, it was very informative, um, but it, that there's, there's a lot there. There's a lot there. Yeah, uh, Tim had a thing here. So Brian, can you post a link to the article? I don't have the link handy, but here's what I can do, Tim. Is let me put a link in here for the locals group. And again, this is free, right? This doesn't cost you anything. 
and I send out notifications on recalls, things that catch my attention. And I put those in there. I will post a link in there after this on locals to the article so that everybody can get a copy of that. So thanks, Tim. Appreciate that. Um, and so I think, I think part of this, right, the lesson is, is food safety is not static, right? Far from it. We're constantly growing and learning and figuring out new things, new threats, new emerging issues, enhanced traceability. And part of this with enhanced traceability too, then, Cara, is that it's like, okay, well, FDA identified these high-risk things that they're looking at. Oh, I don't have, that's not me. Well, if, if you think that's the case, um, that's not how FDA works, right? They, they start with what they're worried about most, and then it expands, right? So FDA is looking at produce and high-risk cheeses and ready-to-eat foods and all these things that they identified on that list. Yeah. Is it coming to everything else? Uh-huh, it is. Right. Maybe. Because what FDA is solving with this is not necessarily a product problem. It's a communication problem. Right. So right. FDA has has been frustrated by the lack of speed from getting to retail where a consumer says, ah, I ate this and it made me sick to where it actually came from. Right. And, right. and in produce, not to pick on produce, but right. That's one of the more challenging things. Right. Is how do you link it back? to a particular product in a field, in a zone, it, woof, right? And how do you do that quickly? Because people's health is at stake. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And and, and that's what we just, you know, it's, it's a public health, right? Public health initiative that is important. It, you know, it is important. So. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that's where these things all intertwine, right? So the enhanced traceability and then back to the environmental monitoring, right, is that and in this article, I talk about this, right, is we tend to focus on zones three and four for our environmental monitoring, our programs that were created 15 years ago by somebody who's no longer even with the company. And we are sampling drains and, oh, we're going to do a, floor, a few floor samples and, oh, OK, maybe we'll kind of sample over here and we'll see what happens. Right. OK, great. That's not what FDA is looking at. Right. FDA is looking at zone one and zone two. Right. Mm -hmm. So direct food contact surfaces, so belts and things like this, where your food is running along the line or whatever, and indirect contact surfaces. So like my example earlier, that PLC panel that the operator is touching all day long that gets covered up at the end of the night because we can't damage that equipment and nothing ever happens. Right. right. FDA is going to go zoop right to that. Exactly. Exactly. And that's where, you, you know, you do have to just it's almost like common sense, right? You just have to have to really think about, okay, you know, what, what will become contaminated? And that's why it's so important to understand, you know, who's your tenant? What's the location? And then sample that. And, and I'm sure you've run into it, Brian, where you go into a facility and it's like, well, we don't sample that because we can't get it clean. It's like, that's exactly <laughs> where you want to sample that, you know, that is exactly, and you want to figure out how you can clean that. Uh, you know, we, we got to figure out and, and do that digging and do that robust sampling. Yeah. And, and here's another, yeah, to your point, when you sample, and that's a, that's a great lead in for this is so in the in investigation operations manual, the Bible that FDA follows for when they're out in the field, when do they sample? Do they sample right at the beginning of production when the equipment's all nice and clean and sanitized and the ATP samples are all great? No, 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 no. FDA is sampling at least four hours into the production run in the middle of your production, right? So everything is dirty and there's stuff everywhere and carts and dirt, you know. And people. That's when, <laughs> and people, right? That's when they're sampling. That's real world. And that's, yep. and they're right to do that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, that, you know, it's, that's exactly what we're talking about. Try and try and figure it, figure out where those residents are, where those tenants are. So that's exactly, exactly. right. Uh, so we had a question here. So thank you. Uh, should the PM data be shared with FDA and how? Oh, interesting. What do you think, Carl? The preventive maintenance? Is that what you're talking about? Well, yeah. I think your environmental monitoring data. Oh, okay. I think so. I'm not, I'm not sure what the P stands for. So if you got some more information for us, we'd appreciate it if we, if we missed the question here. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, if you, you really should have nothing to hide, right? So that, that's the, I know previous, it used to be a little bit more coveted, I guess you could say. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know what your experience has been, Brian, but generally speaking, it's, 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 
it's shareable and and it's it's something that that you know it it is should be available to the fda so. oh absolutely well and, and here's the way i look at it and i agree with what you're saying is that and here's the best way to think about your your systems in your plant is you you kind of have data that breaks down into three buckets you have operational data so pounds per man hour, downtime, product produced during the run, electricity used, all these type of things. The information that the operation team needs to run the plant and keep the doors open and pay all the people and everything else. Important data. But for what we do, it's not, right? Yeah. Um, what we're worried about is two other buckets, food safety and food quality, right? So the food quality would be things like, okay, is the stated weight of our materials meeting the declared information relative to NIST? Are we doing minimum allowable variations and all these things relative to weight, right? So that people are getting what they're paying for. Um, does it have the right sensory, sensory attributes? Does it, is it going to make our customers happy? Food safety, right, is a whole nother bucket, right? Food safety is yes or no. Is this safe or is this not safe? Whereas quality data is more of a business process, right? And we provide in quality assurance the information the business needs to make a decision relative to that. But food safety is a different thing. Right. And the reason I bring that up is under FISMA, everything within your food safety plan, all of your prerequisites, all your preventive controls, all of the data that you use for that is fair game. FDA has the regulatory right to see all of that. And Absolutely. if they choose to, they can copy that information and take it with them. Now, if they do that, I hope you have a good food safety lawyer because they're gathering information for a case against you, right? FDA very rarely does that. But if they're doing that, you know you've got a problem. Mm -hmm. So you need to also look at your data then and say, I need to segregate this information, right? So my food safety data is super clear. My quality data is in a different work stream of how I look at things. And your, your food safety information provides a clear path forward for FDA. So in this particular example of what we're talking about, FDA comes in and says, okay, you're producing a ready to eat food. Environmental monitoring is required. Now required or not required, you should be doing environmental monitoring in every right. I agree with you. <laughs> and if you're doing a ready to eat product, FDA is going to say, all right, let's see your environmental monitoring data. Right now, part of this then too, right, is too clean is also an issue, right? You should be finding things. If you're not finding things, you're not looking hard enough. Yep. And if you come in and you say, oh yeah, we sample five sample sites once a quarter and we've never found anything in the past 10 years. FDA is going to go, really? Right. Well, that's a pretty crappy program. <laughs> uh, they're going to want to, they, they expect that you're going to find things. And I expect my plants to find things. Right. If you're not doing that, you're not looking. Right. You, you're and, deliberately and you, yeah. and you shouldn't be afraid to find things. And right. I think people are so afraid to find things. Um, and, and you shouldn't be afraid. And and just you know, to expound on your point, sometimes too, people um, maybe technique of sampling, mm -hmm. number of samples, location of samples, all those things kind of can play into it, right? Exactly. Um, and and we actually had an incident, this was a long, long time ago, but where they weren't finding anything in an environment. And it was one of those where we thought, well, this is weird, right? Mm -hmm. they, they had never found anything. And then we, we learned that the way that they were sampling, they had been taught, and this is where your training, you have to, have to, you know, make sure that you do your training. They had been taught to take the sample and then spray sanitizer. Yeah. They had that reversed. So they would spray <sighs> sanitizer, take the sample. So they had awesome data on their efficacy of their sanitizer. Oh. Oh, but what I, I had, I, I had an issue with a weird SPC counts one time in my past, right? So we were getting milk samples from a milk route and, and there was really weird on one milk route. There was really weird results and we couldn't figure it out. And we were working with the farmers and they were doing a great job. And so we sent one of my quality managers along with the driver to, to look at, right, to your point, right. the training. And she's going along with him and he doing everything great, right? Getting, get, you know, the sample containers and the ice containers for the samples from the bulk tanks and all these type of things. Perfect. Gets to the plant. And, and if not, if everybody doesn't know here, a whirl pack bag, right? A whirl pack bag is a small little sterile bag that you take the top off of, and then you can put things in that, right? It's already pre-sterilized. So he goes to pull out his whirl pack bag to get his milk sample from the bulk tank, tears off the top, Cara, and then does this. Oh, and you're like, oh. Right, and, and and Gina went, ah, 
And, yeah. and the driver and the driver went, what? What? Yeah. That yeah. little thing. That was yep. it. Yeah. And you probably held product and yeah, there was probably all kinds of strategies around it. And well, and the and the poor the poor dairy farmers, right? We're like, come on, you got to get your milk quality improved. And they're like, oh, I, I don't know what else to do. I brought in experts. I've done all I'm doing everything right. Uh -huh. And they and they were. And they were right, yeah. So that yeah. was a little, yeah. That was um, an interesting conversation. Oh um, yeah, that's a, uh, and and you know, and that's where I think too. It's like that's where you have to review your entire environmental program from the sample locations all the way to the sampling techniques to the methodologies too, right? Uh -huh. And yeah. and the the way that you're shipping your samples and things like that. All the little details can one little miss detail can make a big difference. Oh, absolutely. G Gary had a comment here. Let's see if, see if we cover this or not. Well, I don't know if I agree with what you're saying about the FDA. FDA does come unannounced and does do sampling in the middle of the production run, especially during a facility that runs three shifts 24-7. Oh, absolutely. So Maybe this comment was made before I was talking about what I was talking about. So, so if I miss something here, Gary, let me know because you and I are saying exactly the same thing, right? So FDA is going to do that, guaranteed. Uh, another comment here from Jean: uh, Should environmental monitoring be focused on two to four and not zone one? What if you do and you find a positive in one? Should you recall your products? Ah, right. That's a great and comment. Yeah. I love it, right? So um, if I had a gift certificate to send you, I would do that, right? Because you're, <laughs> you're hitting the, the nail on the head of what we're talking about here, right? Mm -hmm. Is you need to go back and reevaluate your systems and your programs to find these squatters. And if you're not doing zone one and you're not doing zone two and they built this wonderful skyscraper on that surface and you don't even know it's there, Right. Kind of the theory in the past has been, OK, well, three and four are clean because when we, we, we wet clean our plant, everything goes through the drains. We'll find it there. Mm, right. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. Right. That's kind of being disproven. So you need to go back and look at this. Right. And this is all kind of based upon the things that we're talking about here. Right. So your plant environment, your equipment, your processes, what are you making? All of these type of things come into play. And when you're looking at your environmental monitoring program, so you need to step back and it's, Wipe the slate clean and say, okay, the rules of the game have changed. What FDA is doing is completely different than what they did in the past. We need to change with the times. Okay, we need to start. And you can build up to this over time, right? And this is where, you know, having outside people come in because every situation is unique. Every plant is different, even yeah. within the same company. They're completely yeah. different. And you need to approach them differently and say, okay, zones one and two, let's, let's go out and look. Let's see how things move. And just one of the best things we can do in quality sometimes, Cara, is watch. Mm -hmm. right? Just go out and watch. Right. That's it. And, you know, especially when things are changing. Right. Hey, we need to do some construction in the plant. And we think that if we put up this plastic curtain, everything's going to be fine. Oh, right. OK. You know, no, 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 no. We need to do some special stuff for that situation. Mm -hmm. Separate conversation. But look at these things. Right. And start looking at your zone ones and zone twos and see how things move. Mm -hmm. And to that point, right, is if you are sampling zone one and zone two, don't ship the product. Yeah. Right? It's right. like, okay, we're going to be doing this once a month. And everything that we're doing is going on hard hold. Nothing leaves the plant until we get written in our hands results back from the third party lab that shows that our product, our zone one, zone two product related surfaces are clean. And right. then we can release it, right? Yeah. And that's going to give you some really good peace of mind, right? Because oh. now you're looking at things that FDA is going to be looking at and you're gathering data that you can then show to FDA, to your point, Cara, of mm -hmm. here's how we're doing things and here's how we're improving, right? Right. It all comes back to, it's always the basics, right? It's plan, do, check, act, right? Yeah. All right, here's how we're going to do this. Here's how we're going to check that things are being cleaned the way that we think. And if it's not, we're going to go into corrective action. We're going to do vector analysis. We're going to look at things new. And then we're going to either change the plan or get back on course. Right? Exactly. And, and you know, you, you do have to nail that point home, though. If you are looking at the zone one and two for pathogens, you know, you need to have a strategy, a, a hold and release strategy for that product, because it could be implicated if they're, if those come back as positive. So Absolutely. people need to understand that, um, that that is a potential implication of that product. So yep. have a strategy, have a, have a, a strategy for that. So. Yeah. And, and yeah, FDA is never going to mandate that you do that. They will never say you need to hold product, but you need to hold. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. If, if, if you're in charge of quality, hold that product. 
right oh we can we can we can ship it to the warehouse and hold no 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 ah! right? no no third party warehouses no absolutely under our control things happen yeah right? exactly. things happen yeah don't exactly. let it happen yeah. so part of this right and what we're talking about here is it is, is things that we were talking about here with, with, with chip right is case studies learn from other people right and that number one that's why we're here and thank you for being here with us Absolutely. is learn from the mistakes of others right and and avoid their mistakes because if you were able to sit down and talk with those people they would be saying exactly the same thing we're saying right is oh my goodness right if i could go back in the time machine to two years ago here's what i would have done differently right yeah just like share yeah. said if i could turn back time right <laughs> information <laughs> Right. So, um, okay, good. So thank you very much. Looks like we've got that question. So Austin made a comment here. Instill a culture that if you don't find anything, then it's viewed as a failure. Ah, love it. Right. So in, in my mind, it was, it was burned into my skull at, at a previous company from a, a, a very seasoned operational senior vice president. And we would sit down and review the data for the company, for the environmental monitoring. And he flat out told me, he said, Brian, if I don't see hits, in the environmental monitoring procedure, in my mind, that means you're not doing your job. Wow. And I knew at that point I had his, I had his full support. His support. Yep. The, the yeah. culture was there. That's yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's awesome. That's and, great. And I think that's something that's, you know, really been doing a great job of growing Cara is, is this idea around food safety culture and building this out and getting away from this stupid idea that in, in food safety and food quality, we own this, right? And this is ours and if it's a failure, it's us. No, right? Yeah. This yeah. is a company. And that's always been a pet peeve of mine in the past, right? And it's so like, if you wanted to irritate me and, and you know, make me say things I shouldn't say, right? Rah, 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 is, is come to me, right? And say, hey, we got a bunch of product that's on hold for a quality issue. Really? Okay, well, I didn't make it. You made it, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. It's it's not a quality failure, right? It's an operational failure, right? That has quality implications, right? So make sure that that ownership remains where it should be as well, right? right? Mm -hmm. And make sure that you're building this out as a as a team, right? We that, have an we have an we had environmental hits. Let's go out and investigate this as a team, right? This is not, and again, back to what we said before: eyes, more eyes, the better. Yeah. Okay, leadership team. We had some positive hits in environmental monitoring here last month. We're going to go out and do a vector analysis and we're all going to go out and do this. And I love that, right? It is a team. We are a team. And, yeah. and you know, it, that's that's an important um, aspect to instill in everyone at yeah. the facility. I agree. Yeah. yeah. And so part of this and, and part of what I would always train my quality managers on is if you're doing your job correctly, you are essentially the personification of a conscience for the company. You are the paragon of what's good and bad, what's right and wrong, and what passes and fails, right? And it's part of your job is to make sure that your leadership team understands that. So kind of the, the little visual I would use is, is you're the parrot on the shoulder of the plant manager and telling him, this is going good. This is right. great. I'm, I'm happy. This is this is going the direction we should be going, or I'm getting concerned. Right? We we need to start. You know, we need to start looking at this. Or right, the third condition is, oh my goodness, we have you know all hands on deck. We have a huge right. issue. Right? So the, hands so the on goal, fire. <laughs> yeah, green, yellow, red. Right? So the goal is to keep in green, but if you right. go to yellow, bring it back to green. Right? Yeah. Don't keep going. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And your job is to communicate that information. Your job is not to own it. Right. Your job is to communicate. Exactly. And work together. Work yes, together. exactly. That's always the biggest thing, right? So. Yeah, mindset. I think that's a that's a great word for that, right? It's Perfect. The mindset. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, use these different tools. And so part of this, I mean, with, with work with, and this, this is a super valuable tool, right, is your sanitation company. And part of having a good sanitation program in your plant and building this out is your verification and validation, right? And people a lot of times get these two mixed up, right? The validation yeah. part of this is setting it up correctly, right? So here's the right time and temperature and chemical and concentration and all these type of things that your sanitation company helps you create, right? And then the verific verification is making sure that that stays on course, right? It's, it's the same with your environmental monitoring, right? So right. Right, what is the processes for this and how do we verify that things are going the way that we want? 
Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, yeah, and they do. Those terms do get get interchanged and mixed up. But um, yeah, the verification with the environmental monitoring is so important to yeah. to ensure that you're maintaining right. So. Absolutely. Well, uh, oh, man, time really flies on these conversations, Cara. I know. Um, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, a great discussion, everybody. Thank you. That's what makes these things so often, right? Awesome is having all of these conversations because I know some things, Cara knows some things, right? You know some things. Sharing that information accelerates our growth and knowledge. So as we kind of bring this back up to the 30,000 foot level, any, any closing thoughts or things you'd like to share with people that we've kind of missed here relative to the topic? Hi. Uh, there's so much, right? There's so, we could talk for hours. Well, you and I could talk for hours on this, yeah. right? And and we can definitely, you know, expound more. But um, hopefully, yeah. people have gathered some information from this this time, and and will you know, I'm happy to to be you know have people contact me with any questions or any comments or anything like that you can always find me on linkedin i love yeah, linkedin so. <laughs> um <laughs> what, what's your what's your email then cara uh it's it's just my name that's on there and then it's at hydrate.com i should have put it in there but it's at uh h-y-d-r-i-t-e.com so oh, care i'll put it here in the comments so no dot or anything between your yep a dot between cara and nicholson Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Brian. At H-Y-D-R-I-T-E dot com. Yeah, perfect. Thank you're, you. You're welcome. I mean, so part of this, right, too, is I, th I think closing kind of for me as well, too, is these type of things can be overwhelming, right? So part of this, right, this, this is where having someone to help you through these activities is helpful. And yeah. because you, you can't solve world hunger overnight, right? You, oh. you can't go in tomorrow and say, ah, I've completely evicted all these squatters in my plant and now everything is great. This is a process, right? And so you, you take it, it's like that old, you know, elephant one bite at a time, you yeah. know, cliche that we all know. And you have to figure out, okay, what's step one? All right, now what's step two, right? And so when you start thinking about it that way, then it becomes much more manageable. But because we think in terms of systems, we're looking at this big picture and we're like, oh my goodness, right? I'm never gonna be able to do all of this. Right. Yeah, you can. Right? Yep. You, you yep. just need to be methodical in your approach and how yeah. you do this. Exactly. And that's where, you know, groups like locals and, and coming on and talking with experts like this helps you go in that right direction. Right. Because yeah. part of this, too, is you, you don't want to go down a wrong path and then realize six months into it that it's not the right approach. Right. right. So this also yeah. accelerates how you're doing things, too. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so as we kind of close out here too, as we mentioned here in the beginning, Carl, you're you're a super busy person. You've been giving tons <laughs> of presentations and information on, you know, different conferences and things like that. So, thank you for sharing your information. Of course. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you got coming up for everybody? Where can they see you next? Um, so next, I'm super excited. I put together, actually, to culminate all of this, um, in January, I'm going to be hosting an environmental monitoring program workshop. Mm -hmm. uh, at our corporate headquarters in Brookfield. It's uh, January 18th and we can sign up online. Just reach out to me. It'll be a day long and it's going to be just exactly, you know, again, food safety is not a competitive advantage. So we are going to be sharing case studies. I have two of my awesome uh, application technical specialists coming in, Carrie Schimmel and Joel Cook, to give us some Ooh. case studies and what they've seen combined. They've been in the industry for over 70 years. So we're, you know, we're going to tell you all the weird and gross things that we've seen. But then we're also going to talk about how do you, how do you set up a program like this? Uh, and we, you know, we've just got some really exciting stuff. And we're going to actually do sampling and we're actually going to demonstrate tools and, and how to do it. So um, it's going to be a lot of fun. And then we do have some, we always host some food safety Fridays. Yes. So we're going to do that every Friday in February. And we have some great guests. We have Chris uh, Smith from the FDA going to come and talk to us about the new era of smarter food safety. Uh, Monty Bohannon from Leprino and Adam Borger from the Food Research Institute and Martin Wiedemann from Cornell. So it's going to be a, an excellent series uh, wow. each Friday. So, yeah, we're very excited. So, so people can find more information by contacting you and emails Absolutely. in here. And, and, my, and if you can't remember my name, I actually, we, if you type in food safety at hydrite.com, email that, I'll get, you'll get to me. And that's I'm just one now. word, food safety food at hydrite.com. So. I'm going to look that up. That's good information. Excellent. So whew, another amazing food safety chat in the bag. 
thank you everybody for making this so much yeah, fun, right? Thanks, we're everybody. here for this conversation, right? And, and this is amazing. And hopefully we were able to impart a little information and get you kind of thinking about, hmm, maybe, maybe I should kind of look at that, right? Great, right? That's, that's, that's how things improve, right? So exactly. happy to bring this information. And again, thank you for investing your time and spending an hour with us and getting better, right? It's kind of like one of my rules is if I attend a conference or, or a webinar or things like this, if I learn one new thing or one different way of looking at it, it's a win, right? That's a win. Okay. Now you need to take what you learn and apply it. Right. Don't yeah. don't just gather the information. You have to apply it for it to be relevant. So with that, Carl, we'll, we'll close out the food yeah. safety chapter this week. And again, thank you for being here. Greatly. Thank you for it. having me. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Cheers, everybody. Happy yes, Friday. Yeah. <laughs> we will see you back here next Friday. Right. So as we start here into the holiday seasons, right, this is a perfect time to prepare for the next year. So we'll be back here next Friday at the same time. So 10 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m mountain time 7 a.m sorry for pacific people 7 a.m pacific or wherever you're at in the world for the next food safety chat and again we're on linkedin youtube and twitter so thank you again for being here and we'll see everyone next week thanks everybody Bye. thanks brian